All right, guys. Uh, hello. I hope you had a very good, was it a weekend? I don't remember. Today is Monday, correct? I forgot which day it is. So Monday and you know that we are approaching uh, the sufficient knowledge to begin getting ready for exam one. And how do you get ready for exam one? We have a lot of previous exams, right? Previous exam ones, which I advise that you begin solving. If you want, you can do it on time. If you want, you can take longer, up to you. But uh, what I, I would like to see you do is as I am getting ready to, uh, to send you the first exam, I want to see that you come to office hours and maybe discuss the questions from the previous exams, see how you solve them, yes? That will give me a sort of conviction that you have a good will for the subject. It's like a pre-exam tribute. Now, today we are going to talk about uh, page 20. Where are we on comprehension check? Okay, sure, let's do a comprehension check if you think guys, okay? so. This is the situation. Six cards are sampled randomly from a regular deck of 52 cards. Calculate the probability of being dealt three pairs. I think I answered that, but maybe I didn't. I don't remember. So go ahead, calculate that probability. See if you know it. Okay, Andre, thank you. Correct. Come on guys, faster, please. You can do it. Excellent, Ben. Nora, excellent. Okay, we have three answers. One more minute. That's good, you know? Sabrina, excellent. Jennifer, if I didn't say, excellent. All right, so I hope enough of you know how to do it. I'm going to, yes, very good, Erin. Exactly right. Very simple, guys. I, I hope it's very simple. Uh, so always have that, uh, that sample space in mind and the protocol in mind, do you see? So here we represent the cards that we selected. If the cards are 30, 3, 15, 17, 51, 23, and seven, I do not preserve, preserve the order in which they were selected if they were selected in order, right? That might be just the way I observe the cards and, and see? So imagine I'm, I'm dealt a hand, uh, a six hand, a six fingered hand or whatever you call it. And uh, I have those, uh, those six cards here. That's the way I see them left to right from the population. Then I will present them in order from smallest to largest. That's how I present the choices. Make sense, guys? 
So in my protocol, I record them in order that makes it 52 to six possibilities for my sample space. Now I need a protocol for success. Success is three pairs. If I have a three pair, this is how I will document my uh, success. I will say, what are the numbers on the three pairs? Yes, what are the numbers on the three pairs? So let's say those were number two, four, and 11. Remember that I think of the card as having a population ID, which is one through 52, but also having um, a suit ID, which is one through four, and uh, the denomination, whatever you call it, right? Is it uh, ace, jack, or whatnot? I call it one through 13, right? So a card to me is uh, something that has two numbers, uh, a suit number one through four, and a front number one through 13. Good. So here I report the particular uh, front numbers. And here the suits where I get four choose two, uh, one and three are the particular back numbers for the front number. I said the front number was two. Those are the back numbers where the front number is four. Those are the back numbers where the front number uh, happened to be 11. Clear? So it's very easy, right? So you get used to it, you can do it very fast, I hope. Correct, guys? So for the exam, I might invent a, a non-existing deck of cards just to make it, well, just to practice those ideas. Maybe. Right? Now, this is the probability. So the probability is three out of a thousand. Three out of a thousand. Not a very uh, high probability, not something you want to bet, perhaps. Right? Now, I asked you for your birthdays, of course, not all of you responded, but that's my fault. I didn't email it early enough, perhaps. Um, so the birthday problem is this, guys. So if N people are present in a room, so there is a number of people present in a room, uh, and we are assuming that each person has a random birthday, birth date, right? One of 365 days is uh, your particular birth date. So the question is, uh, what is the probability that no two people celebrate the same birthday on the same day? You understand? Can you calculate it? Uh, up to, uh, uh, and then we will estimate what the answer is. You understand my question is, guys? So N is abstract. So some number of people are present in the room. Based on the number of people, what's the probability? So is, if N is 1, obviously the probability is uh, is. 100%, one, one, if the, that, the, that you will not share the birthday with anyone in the room, right? Anyone else in the room. Now, if there are two people, if three people, four people, you understand the question, right? So what's the probability that if you have N people, like in our case, we have, uh, we have uh, 35 people together. What's the probability that none of us in this room share a birthday? Professor? Yes? How are you, you going? Said, yeah, go ahead. You said n equals 1 is 100%? Well, forget about it, right? Uh, just, you, uh, just, just in case n is not clear to you guys, n means uh, some number of people. We will calculate it based on the number of people in the room, right? So in our case right now, I think it's uh, n is equal to 36. Because we are 36 people present in the Zoom meeting. So I want you to calculate for an arbitrary n what's the probability that no two people share a birthday?
Okay, some people responded. Yes, uh, I just mean for an arbitrary n. So uh, assuming no leap year and nothing special like this will make it, uh, yes, so exactly, exactly. Um, good, are we ready guys? So this is the uh, situation. So we will examine it slightly in more detail. I mean, the complete answer should be very easy for you to obtain. I didn't even bother uh, writing uh, the protocols explicitly, right? So first of all, if I have n people, each of them can have a birthday on any of the 365 available days. That's why denominator is 365 to the power of n, clear? So for example, uh, the, the combinations are insane, right? Uh, 365 to the power of 36 for us, because uh, I can have a birthday on any day from January 1st to any other day, right? So 365 choices for me, your choices are not influenced by my choice. And so you have a birthday on any of the 365 days and onwards. So the, the denominator is this. Now success means that uh, no two people have, um, have a birthday on the same day. Good. James join uh, James. Oh, he's still connecting. Uh, I, I need him. Wait, it's good that he joined. Hmm. Connection is bad, I think. So yes, anyhow, you understand guys the, the success rate here. You understand how I build the de denominator. So why do I subtract n and add one? Because uh, I go from zero all the way to n minus one. Because altogether zero to n is all the choices for the n people. So then first person has the possibility of picking a birthday uh, on any day of 365 available. Now the next person, has uh, one less day to pick from because he's not supposed to match with this birthday that was already picked. And the next day is not having two days available to him and so on. Clear? Yes, guys? So, ugh. so, how many people do you think, guys, do you think uh, how many people must be in a room for uh, this to, uh, to have a probability of 50% um, or less? You understand? Yes, Andre, you see that? So it is known, guys, that if you have at least uh, 23 uh, people in the room, the probability of no matches is 50% uh, or less. You understand? 50% or less. Oh, here you go, James. You joined. Uh, finally, I needed you. You will see in a moment why. So we examined what's the probability that no two people have a birthday on the same day. How many people must be in a room for, uh, uh, for no repeated birthdays to occur, right? Uh, and, and that probability being less than 50%, okay? So when n is bigger than 23, the probability of not finding a match on birthdays is uh, below one half. Now, how do I uh, know that, guys? I'm gonna say a few things that are slightly a, a beyond uh, the current topic, beyond chapter two, but we will learn them very thoroughly later on in chapter three, okay? so. What can we think about, guys? We can think about uh, pairing, right? So we can say EKJ is the event that person K and person J have the same birthday. You understand? So EKJ is the event that I, I basically I label people one, two, three, four, etc. And the event KJ represents person K and person J share a birthday. Good. So probability of EKJ is. 365 divided by 365 squared or one over 365. Do you see what I mean, guys? If two people share a birthday, right? So first of all, the possibilities for two people is 365 squared. 
And if they share a birthday, it's one of the days of the year. There are 365 days that could be the days on which they share their birthday, correct? So either it's day one or day two or day three or day four uh, that you consider for the year in which they share their birthday, starting from January 1st, clear? So the probability that they, sh that they share a birthday is one over 365. And therefore the probability that they do not share a birthday is one minus one over 365, right? So this is what we can now do, right? So we can see that how many comparisons are there? If I have N people, there are N choose two comparisons. I can compare person one with person two, with person three, four, five, et cetera, right? So for any, how many choices of two people to compare? There are N choose two trials if I have N people. Do you all see that? and choose two trials because I pick one person and another and I make a comparison. So there are n choose two comparisons that I can perform. So the probability that, uh, that there are not gonna be matches on all the comparisons is approximately so. So approximately uh, on first comparison, one minus one over th uh, 365 that there, that there is no match. Second comparison, one minus 365, that there is no match. All the way to the end choose second comparison, it's gonna be one minus one over 365. Now, we will learn later why you multiply those uh, expressions. It's, uh, you see, uh, it's, you multiply when you have something called independence. The situation is not quite independent, but there is a weak dependence here. You understand this is an approximation. It's not a completely correct uh, estimate, but it's very good. So probability of not having any matches is approximately one minus one over 365 to the power of N times N minus one over two. That's approximately uh, that thing. Which guys, if you are good in calculus, calc two, you can, uh, you can simplify, you can put 365 here and that becomes E to the minus one to the power of N times N minus one over 720. You understand? I can, I can relate it to the number E. As I mentioned, guys, you should know the limits very well. The number E, we will review some of those things. So basically, a very good estimate uh, of the probability of no matches is, we're gonna do it a lot later on, it's E to the power of minus one raised to the power of N and minus one over 720. And then if I want to know what's the like, when is this going to be less than some fixed probability P, I can solve for N, and I get this formula. If this is less than uh, uh, P, then N is bigger than by this quadratic formula than this expression. And then you can just see if P is equal to one half, right? Uh, then uh, I need to have N bigger than 22.999, which is uh, N equal to 23. If uh, P is one tenth, if basically I want the probability of not having a match to be uh, one over 10 or less, one over 10 or less, I need to have 42 people. You see, if there are 42 people in my room, the likelihood that I will not find two people that share their birthday is one uh, over, it's, it's one tenth, if not less. Understood? That's what I'm saying. Now, I did not get all the reports from you. Some of you did not email me, but I got around 30 reports, right? And the probability with 30 reports is that, uh, uh, the likelihood I will not find a match was uh, exactly, oh, it will be of course on exam one naturally, right? Uh, or at least part of it might be, right? Exam one, exam two, I will see, right? Probably I'll put it on exam one. We will learn a little bit of chapter three and you should be able to do it. So exactly guys, the probability of me not finding two people that have a birthday uh, would have been uh, 0 0.2936584. And with my approximation, it would be 0 0.30368. So basically uh, I, with my approximation or the exact solution, which I use the computer to find the exact solution, the exact probability, essentially 30% of failing to find two people that have a birthday, which brings me to our uh, poll. Guys, who here was born on October 3rd? Of course, who else? Who was born on October 3rd? Ryan Chen and James, you are brothers uh, or you are probability brothers, right? 
the rest of you wanted to really evade um, evade the probability and not share a birthday what's the probability you were born on my day never right i've met many many people there has not been a single person born on my day except for carl doinitz the naval uh, the, the 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 naval admiral of german wehrmacht of german uh, what do you call it kriegs what do you call them kriegsmarine Yes. Well, you can just check uh, uh, check uh, for the biography of Admiral Doinitz, uh, the naval commander of uh, Germany during World War II. Exactly. Which, by the way, uh, the Germans want to come after me and take me on a naval ship, by the way. It happens. It's pretty strange, right? They actually make a plan to come here uh, to New York with their ship and uh, take me with them to Germany, right? So I guess they realize that I have to be a seafaring person. Anyhow, let's get back uh, to the lecture. Okay, guys. So a deck of 52 cards is shuffled. Cards turned up one at a time until the first ace appears is the next card, in other words, the card after the very first taste. You understand guys what I do here? I lay the cards flat with their suits facing up on the table and I begin after being shuffled, I begin turning the cards one after another, right? Which is a better bet to say that uh, after the first, be uh, first ace appears, that the next card is the ace of spades or the two of clubs. Is the question clear? What's the better uh, bet? What's more likely, in other words? Clear? Cards are turned. As soon as you see the first ace, what's the, what, are, what, is the, what is the better probability? The two of clubs after or the ace of spades after? So Sarah says ace of spades. Thank you, Sarah. What about the rest of you guys? <clears throat> okay, Fnu says equal, interesting. Anton uh, Grodzki says equal. Uh, Frederick says two of clubs. Of course, guys, it would be nice if you see the answer. What's the probability for each of them, naturally, right? It's not hard to calculate. Well, how can I assume, Andre, that it's not uh, the ace of uh, spades? Maybe it is, right? So before the game starts, of course, right? Once I see the result, it uh, could, be, could be something else, naturally. You bet before the game is played. Okay, okay. But uh, the card that is turned, first you have to see the ace. Maybe it's what you're seeing is the ace of spades, you understand? So let's now calculate it uh, exactly, Jennifer. Uh, so except I think your probability is not, is not right. It's not one over 52. It should be different. Uh, let me explain. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is one over 52. It is, uh, yes, uh, it is one over 52, I think. I'm sorry. Uh, so here is, uh, here is uh, the calculation, guys. All you have to imagine is, uh, uh, all you do, guys, how do you reason? You see, I mean, mm, to avoid all, con all complexity, imagine uh, all the possibilities, right? I can imagine ranking all the cards together, right? So once they are, I, I think of it like a pass pass this mess. Once they were arranged, you have uh, first card, second card, third card. So how many arrangements for the cards? 52 factorial arrangements, is that clear? So if I were to list all the cards, now how many arrangements uh, for the full list uh, correspond to ace of spades being after the first uh, card, okay? So what do I do? I uh, pick out the ace of spades. I, I mean, uh, and now I want to calculate how many ways I can get success. So I pick out the ace of spades and I carry out the permutation of all other cards. And then I find the first ace and I place 
space or space right behind it. You understand? So in essence, uh, in essence, how many permutations I have? I have 51 factorial permutations for the success result. You understand? Success is 51 factorial. Are you with me, guys? Am I saying it fast? I mean, I see some people. Okay, are you with me, guys, or not? Let me know what, what can I help you with, if not. Yep, no good. You can you see it, guys? Right. So I, I'm just I'm just doing two combinatorial calculations. Everybody sees why I chose 52 factorial for the denominator first. The denominator. Those are I, I say. What is I can imagine seeing uh, all the cards uh, coming. I want to say if I flip them all together, I don't need to do it one by one. That's only to create suspense. I can flip them all together once I, I already place my bets. Yes. So I see the cards flip together and I can see any ordering of the cards. So there are 52 factorial orderings for the denominator. Now for the numerator, I need to have a success uh, form, right? So for the ace of spades, my success form can be established this way. If I uh, pull out uh, the ace of spades and just do permutations among the other cards, success means ace of spades following uh, the first ace. So there are 51 factorial positions for all the cards and ace of spades is immediately after the first ace, right? So there are 51 factorial uh, success possibilities. Do you see that? 51 factorial over 52 factorial ends up uh, one over 52. Everybody sees that? Now it's exactly the same. It doesn't matter which card they pulled out. They could have pulled the two of clubs and done the same thing. And the result therefore is also one over 52. Is it clear? You understand how I reason it? I mean, uh, uh, you can have maybe some biases or not, but this way you just enumerate it, just success, uh, success form. How many ways are there to get ace of spades to be, this, to be the card immediately after the first ace? So I, you can imagine pulling it out, doing the permutation, and uh, based on that permutation, the position of the ace of spades is determined because the first ace determines the position of the ace of spades. Is just a question then. Why? <sighs> Are we, in, I feel like if we pull out the ace of spades, we're kind of treating it as, as if everything happens at the same time, so to speak. Like why wouldn't the first ace, couldn't the first ace flipped over be the ace of spades? Yes, of course it could be, but that, that does, not, does not correspond to my success. You understand? What do you do guys? How do you think? Numerator, it doesn't matter if it's likely or not. Numerator is supposed to represent uh, uh, the, the number of ways of, of creating success. In the numerator, in the denominator, you count number of ways of creating any pattern. Numerator is only for success. That's what, that's how you understand it. So we have the Kafka form for the numerator that only is representing success. It has to count successes. If I, given that I had success, it means the first card could not be the ace of spades. It must be the card, the ace of spades is immediately after the first ace. You understand? So if okay, I know so the position of all the cards, all I have to do is look at the position of the first ace, and the second one is the ace of spades. Okay, this purely represents the chance of success at being an Surely ace that. Of uh, you, you will see okay. that, guys. Numerator, that, how do we calculate it? We do two combinatorial problems one for the full sample space, and one for only the success result. What do you consider success? So, numerator is reporting how many successes you have. How many successes can you have? It doesn't matter if they're extremely unlikely. Clear? That's what that, that's what 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 works when you have sample spaces having equally likely outcomes. You just remember that all you do is you count how many nodes are there in the event E divided by the nodes of the event S, and to count the nodes of e, nodes, in other words, the actual point, the actual universes that are contained in the event E, I need to create a document that is helping me to do the counting. That's all. It's as simple as that. I hope you understand, guys. Right, let's move on. So here is your next trial, guys. So again, make a form. 20 offensive and 20 defensive players in a football team. Players are randomly paired in groups of two as roommates. What is the probability that there are no offensive defensive roommate pairs? In other words, the offensive people are together and the, de and the defensive people are together. So the, there is no mixed, uh, uh, there is no mixture there, right? You cannot have a guy that is on, playing on the defense and a guy playing on the offense together in the same room. What's the probability of that? If they are randomly paired.
all you have to think about, guys, uh, it's, it's simpler than it looks. Just do you understand what it means to arrange those people, right? You have to, uh, what I imagine is what I experienced, cafeteria, for example. I imagine cafeteria food. Right, so you place them on trays and then decide how you place them, where you arrange them. And we will do it together. Okay. So be careful, Jennifer. Uh, right. Yes, Colin, it looks good. Ready, guys? Let's do it together. Form a Kafka protocol. Okay. Always, guys, I told you, Kafka protocol. I, it used to be very difficult for me, but when I can see the protocol, I see the question. How am I arranging them in rooms? So here are the 40 individuals I have all together, right? And for a moment, let's suppose that we have room numbers, room one, room two, all the way to room number 20. You see, I, I cross them out because I, that part of the form I'm not gonna use, right? So first, if I do have uh, room one, room two, room three, how many ways are there to arrange 40 individuals? That's for the sample space. So that's uh, 40, choose two, two, two. You understand why it's 40, choose two, two, two? It's, it's like what you have is you have 40 individuals and you have uh, 20 rooms, there are the dragons. Each dragon requires two individuals. Remember that analogy, right? So it's like, that's what I mean, a cafeteria tray. So those boxes represent the tray. Right, this is tray one, this is tray two, this is all the way to tray 20, to uh, whisk those individuals to the rooms. Good. And here, the reason I mark it with this line is that you are going to play, list those individuals from individual that has the smaller number and next to the right is the individual that has the bigger number. You understand? So that I present the information absolutely clearly. So how many ways to do that? So to arrange them all together, it's 40 factorial ways to do that. And now uh, there are two ways to rearrange uh, here, two ways to rearrange here, two ways to rearrange here. So altogether there are two to the power of 20 ways. Good. Are you with me guys? They follow our reason up to the two to the 20. So it's 40 factorial. I placed all the people on my tray and I divide by two to the power of 20 because uh, if, the, if those two individuals are on one tray, I can flip them and still the same outcome, still the same destiny. Right, I just uh, I can easily reconstruct that formula, the multinomial coefficient. So the bottom is two to the twenty. Now because I erase those rooms, look how many pieces are there. You see those dots? I erase those rooms. It means that it means that I could take those dots and I can just reatt reattach the the pair boxes. The pair, you see each pair boxes where you see the dotted line. I can cut it and I can rearrange it. There are 20 factorial ways of doing that rearrangement. Do you agree? Because there are 20 rooms. That's why the 20 factorial part appears here. Once I erase the rooms, there is no mention uh, which room is assigned to which person. So when I erase that, the information in this document is redundant. Clear? You all see why it's uh, 20 factorial here now? That's for the sample space. Now, what happens with uh, the um, we, that, that's true for both uh, A and B parts. This is just the number of uh, outcomes in the sample space. So here, if I have a success rate, then my form will be offensive people by themselves and defensive. So we see uh, uh, that's offensive room, offensive room, offensive room, defensive room, defensive room, defensive room. So I put the numbers here. And how many ways to put the defensive people uh, in here? There are 20 factorial ways divided by two to two to the power of 10. And here, the same number. That's why we get here. You see what happens here, guys? It's two, 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 two. A 20, uh, choose two, 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 choose uh, basically there are 10, 10 copies of two here. So that what, what all together we have 20 factorial divided by two to the power of 10, all of it squared. So the numerator is like this, right? And because uh, uh, we erase the rooms, there are no rooms that are available. We divide this part by 10 factorial and this part by 10 factorial. 
So altogether, uh, this is the number. It's just uh, 20 factorial uh, divided by 10 factorial divided by two to the power of 10, all of it to the second power. Good, that's my numerator. And so then I take numerator divided by denominator and my result is approximately, well, 1.3 out of a million, very unlikely, right? So the, my, if my, uh, my arithmetic isn't wrong, it's 1.34 um, out of a million. Yes, Jack, uh, why do I divide by 20 factorial? You have to remember the guys, you have to build up the basic uh, tools. When you, when you have those basic tools, you can then quicker, uh, quickly form uh, the situation. So I used here multinomial coefficients, right? The way multinomial coefficients work is that uh, they tell you how many ways of uh, placing the food on the trays and assigning it to the, uh, to the different destinies that they go to, okay? So here we have uh, altogether initially 40 people. Initially, we have here 40 people, right? If uh, I knew that, let's say, uh, there is going to be one pair and it's going to go to room number one and another pair is going to go to room number two, going to different rooms is, you understand guys, if Albert and Jack go to room number one and Sebastian and, and Gil go to room number two, do you see that? Uh, that's a different situation than if uh, Sebastian and Gil go to room number one and uh, the, the first people here go to room number two. That's a different situation, right? But in this question, there is no distinction between rooms. They are just divided into pairs. We don't know where they go. That's why I erase the rooms afterwards. So first I imagine that there are rooms and then I erase them. So if, if I have rooms, do you see why it's 40 choose two, 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 two? Yes? You see that? Don't make me force you to see it. I mean, you are, so think about it guys, right? I mean, you don't, I, I know that pressure. I always, uh, when people for ask me to see something, I say, yes, I do, right? I pretend, but uh, you don't feel that you need to pretend with me, correct? I'm such a pleasant person, right? Yeah, I know, yeah, sounds, so. As uh, somebody said, I am such a ple pleasant person with cold, dead, black eyes. Uh, so dividing by 20 factorial deals with uh, unordered pairs. Well, not unordered pairs, maybe you, you but deals with, uh, with um, you might be, it depends of course, Andre, what you mean by unordered pairs, right? So uh, the rooms, are, they're not distinguishable. So I, I can take the numbers in this box and place them anywhere. So they are basically, you see where you have this dotted line? There are uh, 20 uh, double boxes, which can be rearranged and that gives the same destiny because I, can, I don't have any rooms. Right? I don't have any distinct destiny assignments. The, the only destiny I can distinguish is that certain people are together, but not in which room they are. You understand? So if person one and two are together, three and four are together, uh, that's all I can take, but I can tell. But this document tells me one and two are in room one, two, uh, three and four are in room number two, uh, five and six are in the room number three and so on. So the 20 factorial uh, eliminates that distinction. You understand what I mean, right? So all I know is one and two are together, uh, three and four are together, but not uh, wh which is in which, in which room. So initially uh, there were rooms. So initially this used to be unique. So four digits two to two used to be unique, but once I raised the rooms, now that document is no longer unique. It's no longer represents a unique situation. It has redundancies. How many redundancies? Exactly 20 factorial redundancies. Good guys. So if you want, we'll talk about it. It's not easy ideas, you know. So it took me much longer than I bet anyone here to grasp it. That's my feeling about it, right? I mean, uh, I've done it a long time. I taught it a long, long time ago. I think first time I thought it was pretty bad. Then I improved because I, I, I figured out maybe some ways that I can make it precise or logical. Good. So it's very difficult, I think. To me, at least, I mean, so I'm, you see, if you if you get it, it's amazing. And this question, guys, you think about it on your own. I uh, am going to move to the next topic. Okay, part B, read it on your own. I'll move to the next topic. Same idea, right?
again, guys, through all this long time, all I taught you is Kafka protocol. I mean, I hope you learned it, right? Because otherwise either you're already good at it or not, and, now, and I gave you nothing. Okay, here we go. Probability in infinite series. One of my favorite topic is infinite series, as uh, Jack knows. So Axiom 3 makes infinite series very popular. So a pair of dice, of fair dice, is rolled until either the sum of four or eight appear uh, for the first time. What is the probability that the game is stopped on the sum eight? Do you understand the question, guys? So I will throw a pair of dice until I either get, uh, uh, until I get the number, the sum is four or the sum is eight. Whichever comes, that stops the game. As soon as I see uh, on, on both dice, I see a sum is eight, I stop the game. If I see the sum is four, I stop the game. What's the probability the game is stopped with eight? That's my question. Seems irrelevant. Seems what? Irrelevant, you're saying? So doesn't matter, same probability? We'll do it in several ways, guys. Thank you, Andre. Oh, Fiona, you seem to have a cat there. Interesting. Oh, I didn't know you could see my cat. Well, apparently I can. We all have cats, it appears, right? Yeah. 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 Who knows? We might have dogs too, you know? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a few of you said five over eight. I hope you solved it yourself. And then let's uh, look at it together, guys. Okay, ready? So, and then in B, I ask what's the probability if you replace in general we will do it in a moment, right? By just an arbitrary sum of S and an arbitrary sum of T. We will do that uh, in two ways, okay? So here is one way to solve that question, guys. I'm not claiming the best way. We will learn another one in a moment, right? But one way to uh, solve it, okay? So if I uh, have eight appearing as the last outcome, eight appearing as the last outcome, uh, that means that it either appears on the first throw or the second throw or the third throw all, all the way to, in the, to infinity. En means that uh, eight appears on the nth row of the dice and there were no, uh, the four of course did not finish uh, the game earlier. Good, so let's, let's look at that probability. So by, because, because I mean, if the game was over on the nth round and not on the previous round, those events are disjoint, you understand? So the probability uh, eight appears first is disjoint from the probability, is disjoint from the event eight appears on the second throw of the dice. That makes sense, I think. Yes, guys? So you see why they are disjoint. So I know by axiom three that probability is the infinite sum of the individual probabilities of En. 
clear, guys, right? I'm saying if I get eight, it's either on first row, on second row, or third row, or fourth row, and those are obviously not the same. I cannot get eight on the first row and then get it on the second row because the game is over. As soon as I get eight, it stops. So you cannot see both things happening simultaneously. So, so what? So, so then let's try to see how many ways are there to get the sum of eight. The sum of eight can be achieved uh, out of outcomes. First die is two, second six, all the way to first die six and second two. So there are five outcomes that can produce a sum of eight. And there are three outcomes that can produce the sum of four. Good. So uh, the probability that the probability of EN, the probability of EN, and you will see that a bit better later on, I suppose, but the probability of EN is what? It's that the first N minus one trials were neither success nor failure. I received neither sum of four nor sum of eight, which means it's 36 possibilities minus five minus three possibilities. I, I'm not gonna add them, it's not point. It's not uh, going to, I'm gonna use those numbers in a moment, okay? So it's 36 minus five minus three divided by 36 to the power of N minus one and the game is over with five over 36. Five over 36. Because the last result is, uh, 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 is eight. Five possibilities for it. And then this is just a geometric series when I sum it up. You see, it's a geometric series. Now observe that uh, this geometric series is simply the number five over 36 divided by one minus uh, the radius, which is, uh, which is this number. When, when, I, when I multiply everything by 36, look at it, I multiply it by 36, it's five over 36 minus 36 minus five minus three, which ends up being five over five plus three, which is five over eight, good? So I can solve it using infinite series if I'd like. Of course, maybe you figured out a much better way to do that, guys, a much faster way. Now, the faster way to do it is to observe that uh, there is no preference to uh, how the game is over, right? There is no preference on the die, so it doesn't matter if what finishes the game uh, are a combination of numbers that give you four or a combination of numbers that give you eight. Uh, the last step, the last step, I mean, is just, uh, this step is just uh, summing infinite series. I reviewed that. If you have questions about infinite series after class, I will explain again, right? So uh, remember I gave you an hour review for infinite series, guys. How do I do the summation? It's a geometric series, right? Where uh, we know how to sum geometric series. And if not, after class, full explanation again. So here, do you see guys? either this node or this node or that node or that node or that or that or that or that will make the game stop. Do you agree? And there is no preference. You can intrinsically feel it. The, the dice are, well, the dice are indifferent. So uh, it doesn't matter to nature to in finish the game with any one of the available eight nodes. You understand? There are five of those nodes that produce the probability of success, uh, produce the success and uh, all together eight nodes. So it's five over eight. So uh, 36 minus five minus three over 365 to the power of N minus one represents the probability of the sum not equaling either eight or four uh, for the first N minus one trials, Andre. Do you see that? So if I have trial one, trial two, trial three, trial four, if, if the game is over on the nth trial, all the trials beforehand were neither success nor failure. We were in limbo, right? So I need to remove uh, the nodes that would have produced failure or, or success. And why is it to the power of n minus one? Because n minus one, neither successes nor failures. And the last, the nth trial is a success, clear? Yeah? Okay, guys, which I, I bet none of you would like to use that uh, infinite series here because we see the easier strategy. Maybe that's how you solved it, right? Is that you see that the, uh, the end result is one of those eight available nodes, right? The game cannot be over until one of those nodes appears. And the dice have no preference to the nodes that will appear. Do you agree? So the result is there are eight nodes altogether, five of which produce success. So it's five over eight. Is it clear guys without infinite series that it's five over eight this way? 
it's much it's much easier but infinite series also gives the right result my point is that they are they are always there but you don't always have to use infinite series you can use something else if you prefer now how do i do that in general uh, how do i make the sum uh, how do i calculate the probability if, uh, if, if let's say if S means failure and T means success, where S and T are uh, the possible sums, right? So that, let's say I select a sum uh, between two and 12, that will be a failure and I select another uh, sum that will be success. Okay, what is it in general? We can uh, do that as follows guys, okay? Let me show you how to quickly find a formula for sums of dice. Or would you like to do it yourself before I do? Oh, so what, you want to try yourselves or would you like me to speak right away? Yes, here is the question guys. Um, Here, so you understand? Suppose that uh, some S means that you fail the game, you lose, and some T means that you win. You understand what, what this, this means? So, so I just picked failure to be sum of four and success to be sum eight. But in general, I can pick any sum S to be failure and T to be success. Clear? What's the probability of uh, winning the game if I set some S to be failure and some T to be success. It must be a, some formula in terms of S and T. All right, how are we doing? Any progress? Let's do it together, I guess, right? Yes? So how do we think of it, guys? We need to figure out a quick way to, uh, to, to estimate, not to estimate, to know exactly how many ways to get the sum of t. I don't want to solve for T2, T3, T4, it's annoying, right? I want to right away know how many ways to get sum of T. 
and that's not so difficult. Look at it. Um, if I uh, have X is the outcome on die one and Y is the outcome on die two, X plus Y will be T, where both X and Y are between one and six. Good? So far good, yes? So then let's look at it, guys. So what must Y be? If X, uh, if I know X, Y must be T minus X. Do you agree? Because they add up to T. So then I set it up, look at it. So X is between one and six and T minus X is also between one and six. You see that? So that means if I multiply by a negative, it means uh, minus one is bigger than or equal to X minus T, which is bigger than or equal to minus six, which means that uh, I see that, uh, that uh, I, can, I can write it here as, um, I can move the T, so T, look at this, only this line, look at this line, right? So I can move the T to each side, so T minus one must be bigger than X and T minus six must be smaller than X. Are you, are you clear? I'm just simply manipulating the equation. You see this? Y must be T minus X and T minus X is between one and six. And so I multiply by minus one, the inequalities flip, and I see where X is between. X is between T minus one and t minus six, but x is also smaller than six and bigger than one. It must satisfy both conditions, you see? So if x satisfies both conditions, it must be uh, smaller than the minimum of uh, t minus one and six, and it must be bigger than the maximum of t minus six and one. Are you clear? Yeah, might be a typo there, why not? Uh, but uh, well, well, let's see, what is it? So at least uh, with this line, it's correct. So, in or line, well, basically this is correct. I mean, you see, this is correct, good. So because uh, T minus X is between six and one, so uh, so when you flip it, it's so minus one is bigger than or equal to X minus T. Uh, bigger than or equal to minus six, yes? Yeah, that forget about it. You know, I, I'm not sure what I wrote there and why, but uh, ignore it. Good. So here from this line, just add T to both sides. I, I, this must be T minus six. You see, this is T minus six and not T minus X. So that's the typo. Good. Ignore it. Uh, you can see t minus one bigger than x uh, or, or equal to it and x bigger than t minus six. So to satisfy both lines, this line, this line here, sorry, this line and this line simultaneously, it means that x is less than the minimum of t minus one and six and it's bigger than the maximum of t minus six and one. Are you with me? So I know the minimum value it can take and the maximum value I can take. So all I need to do now is how many ways to get some t? I take the maximum value, subtract the minimum value and add one. I hope that's clear why I add one guys, right? So for instance, how many numbers are there between three and seven? So what do I do? I take seven minus three and add one because I do, I, I, if I say seven minus three, yeah, why do I add one? Think about it because I need to count the, you see, when you subtract, you don't count uh, the, the smaller number. So for example, suppose the biggest number is, uh, uh, the biggest number is six and the smallest number is two. So when I say six minus two, once I calculate six minus two is, uh, is what? Six minus two is four. But if you look at it, it's two, three, four, five, six, right? So the four that I represent are over here. That's my four. And then I need, I, I subtracted the uh, smallest number. That's why I need to add one. Is it clear? I hope it's somewhat uh, clear. You need to add one. It's because of the way subtraction works. You, when you subtract, you remove the uh, smallest number available and you need to add it back in. Okay, so, so the general formula, it's just uh, the minimum of uh, of the minimum of t minus one comma six minus the maximum of t minus six comma one plus one. So, for example, if I want the sum of ten, right? If I want to know how many ways to get sum ten, so what I do, I take a minimum of ten minus one and six. So the minimum will be six. 
minus the maximum of 10 minus six, one, and add one to it. So let's say uh, 10 minus six and one, what's the maximum? The maximum is obviously 10 minus six, right? And the, and the minimum here is six. So it's six minus four plus one, and the result is three. That means there are three ways of getting the number 10. And you can check it's obviously right. Yes? Clear? That's what this is saying. Now, of course, if I did it for T, I mean, it's the same result for S. So uh, what I expect is, uh, here is the infinite series here. It's just, um, yes, uh, you can clearly see how to do the problem. Just uh, A is the number of ways of getting T. B is the number of ways of getting uh, S. The probability will be A divided by A plus B because those are the nodes, okay? Where we know how to calculate A and we know how to calculate B. I just did not want to give explicit formulas. Clear? <sighs> okay, so I don't think I will be able to finish the next problem. Maybe I should start, maybe not. Let's think. There is a very famous uh, problem called the matching problem. It's a bit interesting. So suppose what you have is the following. We have N gentlemen and they have N hats. If each gentleman takes a hat at random, what is the probability that no one picks his own hat? Question understood? So let's say we have, uh, you can imagine those are like numbers. So they have the tickets, right, for the hat. So you have uh, one, numbers one, through numbers 10 on the ticket stub that the person is holding. And the clothing item has also the corresponding numbers one through N, right? So I pick my own hat. If I'm person number one, I need to pick uh, the clothing item, the hat that has the, um, the stub with the number one on it. If, if randomly the numbers are picked, what's the probability that no one picks his own hat? That's the question. Good. So this involves quite a lot of uh, formulas. Here we need to remember the inclusion exclusion formula and many other things. I'm not sure if there is uh, any meaning to continue in five here. Would you like me to carry on and speak about it? Or guys, uh, would you like me to end early? Or of course, my favorite game hopefully your favorite game, right? There is going to be some questions that uh, makes me wonder if you can answer them. All right, some of them seem to be not, uh, seem to be um, especially American questions. Mm. Well, I'm not gonna, I, I guess not, no point to speak about this complicated question. In four minutes, I will not finish it. So, Let's see what we can do maybe. Maybe we can look at review problems. Here are some review problems, guys. Let's try to do some of those. Maybe do one question here, right? So I like this one, guys. Number, uh, number seven, what do you think? King Arthur, Sir Lancelot, and another 10 knights are sitting at a round table with their seating arrangements having been randomly assigned. What is the probability that Arthur and Lancelot are sitting next to each other? Compute this in two ways, using the sample space of uh, 12 factorial uh, um, where the outcome carries uh, full seating arrangement details. So because there are y, y 12 factorial arrangements is that uh, you have um, I should say you have uh, uh, you have 12 people, right? All the 12 possibilities uh, and are focusing solely on King Arthur and Lancelot.
what does it say in Hebrew? It says, Betoch Yam Soer, Rak Shneinu Nishaer, Kila Medina, Kila Hava En Medina, which means uh, in a storm you see only two of us remain because love has no country. What does that say, Jack? <laughs> exactly. If you want to, I can tell you what it is. I can play it for you, if anybody is interested. You know, uh, the guy that wrote this song, or, the, or they sang this song, I think he wrote it. His daughter is married to uh, Quentin Tarantino. So you know Quentin Tarantino, yes? This guy uh, was quite the ladies man himself, Zika Pick. Very good singer. And I think he wrote his songs. Not quarantine, I said uh, Tarantino. Uh, did I say Quarantino? I don't know what I said. Uh, yes, w w people are all insane today. I mean, not today, they, they were always uh, insane, but um, certain things highlighted. All right, any ideas, guys, uh, how to solve this? All right. So just draw yourself, imagine what it means to be on a round table, right? How are, are the people sitting? So if they are sitting all together, right? You can imagine uh, looking at it uh, counterclockwise, right? So for example, if, if, if I'm only seeing King Arthur and his friend Lancelot, I either see King Arthur and Lancelot as a package, uh, and then here is the space at which I notice the first guy. So I imagine the table, I imagine moving counterclockwise. And this is place one, place two, place three, place four, and uh, so on, right? How many places are there? There are altogether um, 12 places, right? So altogether uh, 12 places where this is uh, uh, place 12, right? So. If I, so I can see uh, King Arthur in any one of those uh, uh, 12, that's for the success. Uh, and the, no, no, yes, so exactly. So that would be two factorial and uh, 12 possibilities here, right? So any one of those 12 places that that's, I mean, in other words, King Arthur or the first guy here, and then the second, first guy, then second, you understand? So 12 uh, possibilities here for success, how many for the uh, full denominator. Here I'm ignoring, out of sh for, short, for shortness of time, I'm ignoring uh, other people since they don't matter at all, right? That's why I quoted this thing, in the storm you see only two of us remain because as soon as I remember, ignore everything else and only two, that reminds me right away of that song, which by the way, you should listen to, of course, right? Right, maybe uh, instead of uh, what went where, I'll make you listen to his song. I'm a sadist, you know. <clears throat> Good, so what is the denominator? Denominator is uh, uh, now they can be in any position, right? So uh, denominator means uh, uh, I can observe uh, a King Arthur in one place and the other guy anywhere else. So I think, I mean, I think it's two factorial times 12 divided by 12 choose two places uh, times Actually, if I just choose two places, here is one place, here is another, who goes where, so times uh, two factorial. So I think it's 12 divided by 12 choose, uh, choose two. Yes, because uh, we, we choose uh, any of the, or any of the uh, 12 places, we choose two of them, 
and we uh, and we, you see you don't even have to why do I cross it out because I didn't even need to list this all I just said is where are the places I can even do it better just mention where which places are occupied you understand if two places next to each other are occupied they are sitting together doesn't matter which is where right that's why the two factorial crossed out Okay, the simplest way to solve it, I'm saying, I think at least the simplest way I can think of is report which, if, if, which two places are occupied. If, they are, if the two places are together, I just need to report uh, the smallest of the places. Is it place one and then place two or place two and then place three, you understand? Or, um, right, clear? Or place 12 and then place one. So there are 12 possibilities for the smallest uh, uh, place, smallest denomination place. And there are 12 choose two uh, general choices for the places. Good. So why two factorial in the denominator? Uh, because well, I crossed it out. You don't need to consider it. Two factorial because initially I assumed uh, I assumed uh, uh, two places and then saying which place goes to King Arthur. But you don't need to bother doing that. You can do it. The fact that they crossed out means that you never had to report them to begin with. Okay. So, so that you can see a translation, if you want, I'll show you. Uh, is a mostly pop songs. I can show you either this one if you want to stay, and if, uh, I will show you uh, uh, some of his songs, maybe. If you have to go, guys, goodbye. One second. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to show you this one since it's, if you want to, I'll show you, but it, I don't know if it has subtitles, I'll show you one with subtitles. <laughs> 